Hello there. Welcome to our uh, YouTube sharing. This time on civil law, talking about one of the fundamentals, which is property. And in property, we will be touching on uh, a very fundamental topic called ownership. And there are not very complicated concepts here. We will talk about the fundamentals uh, of the codal provisions on property, particularly on ownership. To start the ball rolling, uh, let me just uh, bring in uh, the little titles that uh, we have. Just to introduce myself uh, to you, my dear friends. I am Dean Jo Santos Balagtas Biscera. And I have uh, three fields where I'm coming from. The field of academics, the field of business management, and the field of law. I have a Bachelor of Business Administration, major in accounting, certified public accountant, University of the East, Summa Cum Laude. Master of Business Administration, MBA, University of the Philippines, Diliman, Magna Cum Laude, Valedictorian. Bachelor of Laws, University of the East, Cum Laude, and Valedictorian. I immediately joined the corporate uh, business world after graduation and taking the CPA board examination starting as a financial analyst and after about 40 years ending up my career as the most senior in the field of finance, executive vice president and chief finance officer. The organizations uh, including multinationals and big companies in the Philippines that I've been with include executive vice president, corporate treasurer, and the Chief Finance Officer of Fuji Xerox Philippines, the ones that are dealing with Xerox machines in the country. I was one time also the Director, Finance and Administration, pharmaceutical company GlaxoSmithKline that used to be SmithKline and French overseas company. I was Finance Manager, in the semiconductor electronics industry with Motorola Philippines. I was controller and director for financial services of an integrated transport company, Delgado Brothers Incorporated. I started my career with the petroleum and oil industry, joining them as financial analyst and ending up as the most senior accounting supervisor, uh, inventory and cost accounting, ESO Philippines that became Petron Corporation. I also had a stint with the World Bank, doing two major projects for them in the local water utilities administration and the fisheries sector. In the field of uh, business education, for 35 years, I was MBA professor in financial management at De La Salle University Graduate School of Business and for 10 years with the UP MBA program in Diliman. In the field of law, I am the incumbent dean, College of Law, University of Manila, where I'm also the vice president for legal affairs member board of trustees. I had uh, also a stint with the University of Perpetual Health where I was also the Dean of the College of Law uh, both in Las Piñas and Binyan and Vice President for Legal Affairs. Immediately after I passed the bar even when I was a full-time uh, finance manager of Motorola I started appearing 
in civil, criminal, and labor cases before the Metropolitan and Regional Trial Courts in Metro Manila and the nearby provinces as well as the Labor Arbiters and the National Labor Relations Commission. Several of my cases reached the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court where I had respectable performances. Because of these uh, experiences both in the business uh, management field and the field of law, I was nominated Associate Justice Supreme Court of the Philippines in 2012 and 2016. I am an incumbent professorial lecturer, Mercantile Law and Criminal Law, Philippine Judicial Academy. And I continue to be a practicing lawyer appearing in courts, including online court hearings right here in my home office. I've been bar reviewer and law professor not only at the University of Manila, but also at the University of the East, the University of Santo Tomas, De La Salle University, the University of Perpetual Health, San Sebastian College, and Far Eastern University. Without much ado, let's now keep rolling on the topic of property under civil law. It is a very important axiom in property that no person shall be deprived of his property without due process of law. That is without any uh, uh, notice, without any hearing, and without any judgment on the basis of the facts presented. What are the characteristics of that terminology property? Property refers to all things which may or may not be the object of appropriation uh, which is a claim for ownership being considered either as immovable or real property and movable or personal property. The first type of uh, property is what is called immovable or real property. And this would include uh, buildings, uh, factory sites, as well as piers and docks. To be specific about it, immovable or real properties would include land, buildings, roads, and construction of all kinds adhering to the soil. They would also include trees, plants, and growing fruits while they are attached to the land or form an integral part of an immovable. Obviously, the, tree, the, the, the trees that are fruit-bearing, when the fruits are picked out of the tree, the fruits cease to be immovable properties. They become movables. In fact, a mother of them become consumable fruits. The third type of immovable or real property is everything attached to an immovable in a fixed manner in such a way that it cannot be separated therefrom without breaking the material or deterioration of the object. Some examples would be air conditioning units, whether centralized or window type. Because once these air conditioning units are installed, they are relatively fixed attachment to the building or structure on which they were installed. Fourth category of immovable or real property would include statues, reliefs, paintings, or other objects for use or ornamentation placed in buildings or on lands by the owner of the immovable in such a manner that it reveals the intention to attach them permanently to the tenements. The fifth category of immovable property would include machinery, receptacles, instruments, or implements intended by the owner of the tenement for an industry or works, which may be carried on in a building or on a piece of land 
and which tend directly to meet the needs of the said industry or works. Take note, ladies and gentlemen, that I had some difficulty when uh, we were being uh, assessed real property tax on the movable machineries that we have in Motorola, a semiconductor company. Because our assembly uh, uh, equipments are so mobile, almost like the size of uh, sewing machines, which we would realign and move depending upon the production schedule that we have. And so it was my original position against the city government of Paranaque in the 80s that these machineries are movable equipment and therefore should not be included in our real property tax liabilities. The uh, local government of Paranaque cited the local tax code and now uh, affirm in the definition of the civil code that when the machinery becomes an integral part of an industry, even when they are physically mobile, they become part of what is called immovable or real property. Number six, uh, immovable property would include animal houses, pigeon houses, beehives, fish ponds or breeding places of similar nature in case their owner has placed them or preserved them with intention to have them permanently attached to the land and forming a permanent part of it, the animals in these places are included. Until, of course, the fish, until all of the uh, animals that you are breeding, you would now harvest for purposes of selling it as your, the product of your fish farm. Continuing now with the uh, remainder of the listing of properties, we would now have here the second category of property and these are the movable or personal properties. And you can see on the uh, upper uh, right hand side of our screen, the various cars that are on the road, each of these cars would be movable or personal property. In the middle are jewelry, and on the extreme right are instruments that you would see would include a set of drums, electric guitars, and even the amplifiers. Technically, they are all movable and therefore considered personal properties. To enumerate the specific personal properties, we shall now uh, consider all things which can be transported from one place to another without impairment of the real property to which they are fixed. So technically, the machinery that I was mentioning would have fallen under this category, but somehow along the line in the local tax code and even in our civil code, when machinery is intended to be used as an integral part of the manufacturing or the industry uh, where it is uh, situated, then it will not be considered movable or personal property. It will be considered as immovable or real property. Second category of movable property are real property. Watch out, real property, which by any special provision of law is considered personal property. The third one would be forces of nature which are brought under the control of science. And finally, number four, those movables susceptible of appropriation which are not included in the preceding listing. Movable or personal properties can be further uh, divided into the consumable personal property and the non-consumable proper, uh, personal property. And we are seeing some pictures of these types of properties. For example, for instance, consumable personal property would be movables, which can be used by their very nature through being consumed. And you can see here a beautiful big 
sandwich, you know, being eaten by its uh, intended uh, victim, if you may call it. Uh, and that would be considered his personal property and it is consumable as it enters his entire digestive system and goes up when he goes to the comfort room. On the middle and uh, right-hand portion of the screen, we will in turn see some examples of what are called non-consumables or otherwise known in economics as the consumer durables. They represent all other movables that are by their very nature not to be consumed. And so you have a white beautiful car there. Uh, it has a label Mercedes Bench. It looks sporty. And on the extreme right, you will have a number of appliances. You would have speaker systems for your television sets, such as sound bars. You will have, of course, spe uh, the main speakers. You will have your refrigerators, your smart television sets, and other uh, types. And you have also uh, there your your uh, laptops and your computers, your computer printers, your uh, portable transistor radios, and obviously your cell phones. All of them are examples of movable or personal properties that are non-consumable durables. Let us now talk about the bigger picture and let's talk about the public domain. When we looked at nature, obviously we see properties all over nature. And in this picture you have at the uh, horizon, you have your mountain. And on the foreground, you have your fields. Maybe your rice fields, your corn fields, and all of those the pieces of lands they use for agriculture. And when we speak about public domain, we are reminded of the Regalian Doctrine, which we inherited from our forebears, you know, from even from our conquerors, starting with the medieval ages, where you have the kings who were granted uh, the, the full recognition that their position as kings were really given by God. And so if God gave them the position of king, they, they, they rationalize that all the lands under their uh, responsibility must have also been given by God. And so the Regalian Doctrine was born, which uh, submits the uh, concept that all lands of the public domain belong to the, initially to the king. And later on, when people sovereignty were recognized, it is now all lands of the public domain belonging to the state. Under the Regalian Doctrine, the state is the source of any asserted right to ownership of land and charged with the conservation of such patrimony. The Regalian Doctrine has been consistently adopted by the Republic of the Philippines in its 1935, 1973, and 1987 Constitution. Continuing with the concept of Regalian Doctrine, it says, All lands not appearing clearly within private ownership are presumed to belong to the state. All lands not acquired from the government, either by purchase or by grant, belong to the state as part of the inalienable public domain. The state determines if lands of the public domain will be disposed of for private ownership. And there was this beautiful uh, decision of the Supreme Court in the case of DNR versus YAP, an end bank decision of October 2008, where the focal subject matter was the ownership of land in Boracay Island where some of those have been occupying those lands for quite some time, ultimately applied to have those lands titled under them. And uh, the DNR objected to that, 
claiming that most of those lands in Barakay are public lands uh, belonging to the public domain and are therefore not available for the issuance of title. The case reached the Supreme Court, which gave the Supreme Court an opportunity to revisit the concept of how property uh, rights evolved in the Philippines. And this particular discussion on the Regalian Doctrine was lifted from that DNR versus Yap. We now see uh, Corona del Valley, one of the most beautiful uh, pieces of lands we have in Mindanao, uh, starting from South Cotabato, reaching up to Jensan or uh, the Jangas. And so, continuing with the Regalian Doctrine, it is good to revisit the history of the Philippine uh, law on lands, starting with the Spanish regime. And so when the Spaniards, uh, headed by initially Magellan, but subsequently followed to really dominate and conquer the Philippines by Miguel Lopez de Legazpi, the Spaniards, upon the conquest uh, of the Philippines by Legazpi, declared that ownership of all lands, territories, and possessions in the Philippines passed to the Spanish crown. A, manif a strong manifestation of the Regalian Doctrine. The Regalian Doctrine was introduced in the Philippines to the laws of the Indies and the Royal Cedulas, which laid the foundation that all lands that were not acquired from the government, either by purchase or by grant, belong to the public domain. And you can now see, therefore, the full control of the Spaniards on all the lands in the Philippines. Obviously, uh, this was a source of uh, the various revolts. And among ourselves, this is where the pride of the Muslim Filipinos come from. Because they never recognized the authority of Spain over them. And they claimed they were never invaded or conquered and dominated by the Spaniards. And so even their lands did not fall under the control of the Spaniards when they were ruling this country for 350 years. Ergo, the Philippine government would have a difficult time to rationalize while the lands in Mindanao, especially under the control of Muslim Filipinos, should be under the uh, control of the Philippine government. The laws of the Indies was followed by the Lay Hypothecaria or the Mortgage Law of 1893. It is good to go back, you know, to, to these historical facts because even after the Americans came over, because of the 350 years of uh, Spanish domination, Many of the lands were carrying what are called Spanish titles. And we will see later on that it was only somewhere in 1976 that the government took a difficult uh, decision to finally nullify the legal effect of Spanish titles. But we will go into that. And so that is the reason why we're trying to trace how these uh, lands were being managed uh, under the regime of the Spaniards. So the, the royal decree, so under the laws of the Indies, was followed by the Ley Hypothecaria or the Mortgage Law of 1893. The Spanish Mortgage Law, this one provided for the systematic registration of titles and deeds as well as possessory claims. So does the first major effort under uh, the Philippines as a state under the uh, uh, guidance and supervision of the Spaniards to start registering titles and deeds of properties. The Royal Decree of 1894 or what was uh, popularly known as the Maura Law partly amended the Spanish Mortgage Law and the laws of the Indies to establish possessory information 
as the method of legalizing possession of vacant crown lands. So there is possessory information as a basis of saying that this crown land that is vacant, I am now applying to be named, you know, after me under certain conditions which were set forth in said Maura law or decree. Possessory information title to be perfected was one year after the Maura law was enacted on 17th April 1895. You will notice 1895 when Rizal was born in, 18, in 1861. Otherwise, the lands were reverted to the state. So here is the real uh, coup de grace. If there are any doubts about whether or not a piece of land uh, has private ownership, if there is any absence of possessory information title, and that was not perfected in one year, all of the lands that are supposedly not titled goes back to the state. And that is the reason why it is very important for us to understand that most of the lands in the Philippines at the very start and during the time the Spaniards were running this country were in the hands and ownership of the government. Private ownership of land under the Spanish regime could only be founded on royal concessions, which look, took various forms. And there are five forms of uh, uh, royal concessions. Number one, titulo real or royal grant. So it will be the uh, government that says, I am granting you this particular piece of land. Number two, concession special or special grant. Number three, composition con el estado or adjustment title. Number four, titulo de compra or title by purchase. And number five, information possessoria or possessory information title. So in 1896-1998, uh, when the Philippines was claiming it established the first Philippine Republic, the Americans uh, lo uh, launched their massive war against the, Sp the, the, the Filipinos and ultimately took control of the government of the Philippines. The Philippine Bill of 1902 is the first law governing the disposition of public lands in the Philippines by absolute grant. This one is absolute grant or freehold system and by lease under the leasehold system that the Americans introduced. Under Act Number 926, agricultural land was defined to be those public lands acquired from Spain which are not timber or mineral lands. And you can imagine the massive public lands that the Spaniards turned over to the Americans by the conquest of this country by the Americans. Under American rule, lands of the public domain were classified into three grand divisions. These lands were agricultural, mineral, and timber or forest lands. So agricultural, mineral, and timber or forest lands. The Land Registration Act, which is Act Number 496 of February 1903, established for the first time the Torin system of registration, uh, which apparently was copied and borrowed from Australia. And so under the Torin system, titles were being recorded and titles so recorded under the Torin system assume the characteristic of being absolute, indefeasible, and in. Prescriptible. And so continuing with the history of uh, uh, the land laws in the Philippines under the American regime, the first Public Land Act, Act Number 926 of October 1903, introduced the homestead system that paved the way for many Ilocanos and uh, Ilongos and uh, Cebuanos to migrate to Mindanao and made provisions for judicial and administrative confirmation 
of imperfect titles and for the sale or lease of public lands. It permitted corporations, regardless of the nationality of persons owning the controlling stocks, to lease or purchase lands of the public domain. So initially, under the first Public Land Act, even uh, corporations owned by uh, non-Filipinos were allowed you know, for lease or purchase. Open, continuous, exclusive, and notorious possession and occupation of agricultural lands for the next 10 years preceding July 26, 1904, that is in 1894, was sufficient for judicial confirmation of imperfect title. And so you can imagine a Filipino may or may not be holding a Spanish title, but for the past 10 years, from 1894, it was in open, continuous, exclusive, notorious possession and occupation of a piece of agricultural land. Then it opens the opportunity for him to go to court and ask for the judicial confirmation, asking now that title be given to him on that land that he is occupied for 10 years since 1894. However, the first Public Land Act, that's why it's in blue, has been uh, overtaken by the se second Public Land Act, Act Number 2874, in November of 1919. Uh, and that particular uh, Act Number 2874 superseded Act Number 926, which is the first Public Land Act. And the second Public Land Act limited the exploitation of agricultural lands no? to Filipinos, and this time the Americans were included. And citizens of other countries which gave Filipinos the same privileges. So there are three types of of citizens that can exploit agricultural lands in the Philippines when the second Public Land Act was enacted in 1919. And number one, these are the Filipinos, number two, the Americans, and number three, uh, citizens of foreign countries, where in the foreign country they also gave Filipinos the same privileges of exploitation of their own agricultural lands almost reminding us of the conflict of lost concept, you know, that I will grant you that same right that you are giving to me in your own country. For judicial determination of title, possession and occupation and concepto dueto, since time immemorial or since July 26, 1894, was required. So the 10-year uh, period that was granted in the first Public Land Act number 926 of 1903, was continued in the Second Public Land Act, in that anybody who has been exploiting that agricultural land, but now includes Filipinos, Americans, and foreigners, uh, if they have already been cultivating that land and occupying it in an open, continuous, exclusive, notorious possession and occupation since July 26, 1894, they would be entitled to file before the courts a judicial confirmation of their imperfect title to make them perfect. Finally, the Americans uh, officially left us to be sovereign Philippines in 1946. And in 1946, uh, even before 1946, when we had our Commonwealth government, a general law, Commonwealth Act 141, was enacted to govern the classification and disposition of lands of the public domain other than timber and mineral lands, and included also governing privately owned lands which reverted to the state after the passage of the 1935 Constitution amended Act Number 2874 on December 1936. In effect, uh, the Second uh, Public Land Act uh, uh, was overtaken by the 1935 Constitution where the general law of 
uh, Commonwealth 141 took over the sub, uh, substantive law governing land registration. Said the Commonwealth Act number 141 retained the requirement under Act number 2874, the Second Public Land Act, of possession and occupation of lands of the public domain since time immemorial or since July 1894. However, Republic Act number 1942 superseded this General Law of Commonwealth Act 141, which provided for a simple 35-year prescriptive period for judicial confirmation of imperfect title. So today, that is what is in place in, the, in, in our civil code. Actually, it is not 35 years. It has been reduced to 10 years if the occupant of that uh, land of public domain uh, is occupying it in good faith as an owner or 30 years even if there is bad faith in the occupation provided that particular agriculture land was later on declared to be alienable and disposable land. The judicial confirmation of that imperfect title required uh, at that time and the Republic Act 1942 30 year prescriptive period. But today you have only 10 years as a, uh, an occupant in good faith and 30 years even if there is absence of good faith. PD number 1073 amended uh, Republic Act 1942 which now pre provides for possession and occupation of land applied for since June 12, 1945. And so if you are a Filipino and you have been occupying a land that is declared alienable and disposable, the counting of the 10 years or 30 years will start from June 1945. In 1976, PD 895, it is very monumental discontinued Spanish titles as evidence in land registration proceedings. There, before 1976, a lot of landowners would now apply for a title, you know, under the imperfect, under the uh, uh, judicial confirmation of imperfect title. And one of the documents they will be presenting are the Spanish titles to establish that they really have an inquit right over the lands that they are applying for. In, 19, in 1976, PD 892 started uh, disallowing or discontinued the use of Spanish titles for land registration proceedings. So what happened? Holders of Spanish titles were asked to register the lands under Act Number 496 within six months from the effectivity of said degree in 1976. So in 1976, it was not totally removed yet. They were given six months so from, 19, from, from February 1976, March, April, May, June, July, August. In August 1976, all the holders of Spanish titles should have registered their lands, you know, conceptually under the Torrent system. Recording of unregistered lands governed by Section 194, Revised Administrative Code, was amended by Act Number 3344. So, if it is unregistered land, where what you now use is not the uh, what you call this PD 892, you use now uh, essentially the Revised Administrative Code for unregistered lands. But for lands which have uh, imperfect title, it is the Property Registration Act. Having therefore reviewed and went through the uh, historical uh, journey of how our public land laws came into being as of today under the uh, Property Registration Act uh, and under, of course, uh, this particular uh, PD 892 for unregistered lands, or the revised administrative code for unregistered lands. The lands of the Philippines now, under the 1987 constitution, 
can be classified as number one, in the 1987 and 1935 Constitution, there are four categories. The agricultural land, the timber land, and the forest land. And in the 1987 Constitution, what was added was national parks. In uh, the 1973 Constitution, they started creating more categories but were reversed in 1987. In 1973, we defined our lands to be agricultural lands, industrial or commercial lands, residential lands, mineral lands, resettlement lands, such other classes, including timber or forest and grazing lands. The 1987 Constitution decided to revert back to three categories of agricultural, timber and forest lands and added only the national parks as the fourth uh, category of lands in the Philippines. While uh, we, we go back to the sovereign Philippines, uh, we missed a particular thing here and I would like to emphasize it now. That the in 1978, the Philippines came up with Presidential Decree 1529 that brought about the Property Registration Decree, which amended Act Number 496. And the Property Registration Decree, decree codified the various laws on registration of property. It assembled all the registration of property and said from now on, it is this codification or compilation that we will now call the Property Registration Decree. And that included the registration of lands under the Torren system and unregistered lands including chattel mortgages. And so that should have been uh, presented before our classification of lands that we already took care of. We shall now start a, a uh, another s segment of our discussion on property and we will now start with the subject matter of property ownership. Properties in the Philippines can generally be classified as those belonging to the public domain and those that are private ownership. And historically, you will remember under the Regalian Doctrine, all of this is started as government uh, uh, properties or lands by the state. And so it came to pass because of the series of uh, uh, evolutions of our uh, ownership of land. Finally, the government today recognizes that the bulk of our uh, lands are still public domain or uh, lands belonging to the state. But gradually, with the introduction of the property registration decree that we showed a while ago, we now have private ownership as a component of ownership in the Philippines. If we look at what is public domain, public domain may consist of three types of lands under the control of the state. The first one are lands that are for public use. And they com consist of roads, canals, rivers, torrents, ports and bridges constructed by the state, banks of rivers, shores, road streets, roadsteads, and others of similar character. So this is public use and they're very specific. The second category under public domain are those lands that are used for public service and the development of the national wealth. And finally, we have what is called patrimonial property. Those that are not in the public use category or public service category, but they are patrimonial properties. On the other hand, the properties that belong to the provinces, cities, and municipalities 
would comprise only two types, those that are for public use and those that are patrimonial properties. The provinces, cities, and municipalities do not have the category of public service and development of national wealth which is present in the national government. And so for the local governments of provinces, cities, and municipalities, the properties that are categorized as public use would be the provincial roads, the city streets, municipal streets, the squares, fountains, public waters, promenades, and public works for public service paid for by said provinces, cities, or municipalities. And again, these provinces, uh, cities, and municipalities would have their own patrimonial property. Moving now to private property ownership, the second major category, which is outside the public domain. Private property ownership refers to all property belonging to private persons, either individually or collectively, besides the patrimonial property of the state, province, city, and municipalities. The Civil Code defines that ownership may be exercised over things that are tangible or rights that are intangible. So an owner can have his property by way of tangible things or by way of intangible rights. The owner's right over the thing he owns would include his right to enjoy the property, to dispose the property, and to recover the property if it is taken out of him. The specific provisions read, the owner has the right to enjoy and dispose of a thing without other limitations than those established by law. And the owner has also a right of action against the holder and possessor of the thing in order to recover it. Under the concept of ownership is also the doctrine of self-help. And the provision of law in, uh, reads, the owner or lawful possessor of a thing has the right to exclude any person from the enjoyment and disposal thereof. For this purpose, he may use such force as may be reasonably necessary to repel or prevent an actual or threatened unlawful physical invasion or usurpation of his property. The self-help doctrine envisions that the owner or there is a lawful possessor of the thing is in actual possession and control of the property and a third person is trying to enter by force in order to uh, uh, get the owner or the lawful possessor to give up that particular property. Under the doctrine of self-help, the owner or the lawful possessor may use force in order to prevent the intruder from taking over the property that is under his possession and control. In the case of Herman Management versus Hernale, a 1989 decision, the Supreme Court has the opportunity to say that the doctrine of self-help can only be exercised at the time of actual or threatened disposition. The owner must resort to judicial process for the recovery of property when he has already lost possession. Meaning self-help has to be evidenced by actual physical control of the property, whether as owner or as lawful possessor. But when the intruder has succeeded in physically ejecting the owner or lawful possessor, that particular owner or lawful possessor cannot return the favor because of the principle of not taking the law into your own hands. If you were deprived of what uh, uh, belongs to you by way of possession or control, then you can now go to court and ask for redress of grievance under uh, uh, an action for ejectment. 
obviously an owner in order to prevent any intruder would have the liberty and the right to make a fence on his property with walls, ditches, and hedges. The provision reads, every owner may enclose or fence his land or tenements by means of walls, ditches, live or dead hedges, or by any other means without detriment to servitude constituted thereon. An owner is also expected not to uh, harm or injure any person arising from the owner's use of the property. This follows the general principle that every person has a right to swing his uh, arm, to swing his fist, but that right ends at the tip of the nose of his neighbor. So, the provision on no injury on ownership of property reads, the owner of a thing cannot make use thereof in such a manner as to injure the rights of a third person. I remember in uh, undertaking the management and supervision of a leading subdivision in Paranaque. We were confronted with the uh, anomaly of having a big, big house apparently being leased out by its original owner. And we noticed that uh, this particular big house has a number of cars that would be parked and would even uh, clog these, these side streets, uh, slowing down the flow of traffic. Because uh, in, in early and late evenings, a number of gentlemen in fancy cars would come and visit that house. And on closer scrutiny, we noticed that that house had a lot of beautiful girls as, applica as, as occupants. And we were wondering what, uh, you know, scantily clad uh, uh, girls that would be uh, roaming around the house and even visible to us uh, passers-by would be doing and being visited by rich uh, old men. And our intelligence indicated that sex was being peddled for a fee. And so this is an example of an owner of that house making use of his house essentially to create an immoral atmosphere and therefore enduring the peace and tranquility of our community. Luckily for me, I, I did not have to do anything uh, uh, legally because after a while, many of the homeowners were starting to make noise and starting to you know, use the usual chismes. And so finally, the owner operator decided to close that supposed business. Continuing now, a stranger's interference to prevent danger and damage. This is one of the more interesting uh, subject matter on ownership. And it reads, The owner of a thing has no right to prohibit the interference of another with the same. If the interference is necessary to avert an imminent danger and the threatened damage, compared to the damage arising to the owner from the interference is much greater. The owner may demand from the person benefited indemnity for the damage to him. This is quite uh, an interesting provision because first it envisions a property owner. And it says that that property owner cannot stop another person from interfering with his property. And the interfering person is doing an act in order to avert, no, to avoid or to stop an imminent danger and a threatened damage. So the owner of that particular building, for example, or house, cannot stop his neighbor from entering that particular house and starting to, to, uh, to do something about the house uh, in order to prevent imminent danger and threatened damage. 
And I have not encountered this particular situation uh, for the, uh, years now. Neither did I find any decision of the Supreme Court where a conflict came out arising from this provision. And so using our imagination, we can now probably uh, think about uh, a situation where there is fire, you know, there is a fire, uh, a fire, a small fire is starting in a house. And suddenly, the neighbor of that uh, house entered the premises of that particular house without or even against the uh, approval of the owner of that house. Because the neighbor, who is the interfering neighbor, tried to put off the fire uh, that he saw happening in that particular uh, house or building. And the reason why he is given that particular privilege of not being stopped by the owner of the house is because there is imminent danger or there is a threat for a damage to his own house next door if the fire should continue. This is the best way to illustrate this, you know. It can also, uh, later on, we will also discuss about the danger of falling trees and so on. But this is the foundation for all of those provisions in so far as ownership is concerned. Now, on ownership, possession of the property is presumed an act of ownership. Now, this is very, very important. Actual possession under claim of ownership raises a disputable presumption of ownership. The true owner must resort to the judicial process for the recovery of the property. I am now handling a case here in C5 where, you know, a member of a family, a big family, uh, decided to claim ownership of the entire uh, property, which was uh, supposed to be uh, the entitlement of his brother and the entire family arising from being members of the military. What he did was when uh, the, uh, the, the military uh, reservations were up for sale, certain portions called uh, enlisted men's barrio in this case is pembo which is p-e-m-b-o or it's panzer enlisted man's barrio which was intended for the members of the army's scout rangers who carry the symbolism of pan uh, panther but uh, and so so therefore uh, the members of the armed forces, not necessarily limited only to the members of the Panthers Scout Rangers, were able to occupy, by permission of the military authorities, certain lands that they made to be residents. So, when the uh, military reservations were being sold out, the question was whether or not to drive away these soldiers uh, and have the properties they are occupying to be included in the disposal. Uh, President uh, Fidel B. Ramos uh, reconsidered that position and declared that all of those uh, uh, communities occupied by members of the armed forces of the Philippines would, now, would not be taken uh, over for purposes of selling that those who are occupying those uh, that th th those uh, residential places will now have the authority to uh, claim ownership of those lands, and so that is how this thing has. And so everybody, and there was a particular uh, series of presidential decrees where one of them said that whoever is in actual physical possession of that site of residency would have uh, a claim for ownership of that particular land. And so there is where possession is presumed to be ownership. Next, 
recovery on the strength of one's title. So if somebody for some reason grab your property that belongs to you and you cannot use force to retake that property, then you go to court to claim under uh, unlawful detainer or uh, a case of uh, uh, ejectment. In an action to recover, which is ejectment, the property must be identified and the plaintiff must rely on the strength of his title and not on the weakness of the defendant's claim. Expropriation for public use and with compensation. This is lifted directly from our constitution and the provision in the civil code reads, no person shall be deprived of his property except by competent authority, an exercise of the sovereign right of the people of the, of the state on, uh, on, on eminent domain and for public use and always upon payment of just compensation. Uh, a related provision says no compensation on expropriation for health, safety, or security. And the provision reads, when any property is condemned or seized by competent authority in the interest of health, safety, or security, the owner thereof shall not be entitled to compensation unless he can show that such condemnation or seizure is unjustified. So take note, not all expropriation proceedings are entitled to just compensation. When the government takes over a particular property in the name of the exercise of eminent domain and the purpose for which the eminent domain is being invoked for, uh, for the use of the property for health, for safety, or for security, then there is no need for the government to pay compensation for the owner that has uh, lost his ownership. And again, the foundation for that is because of the Regalian Doctrine in that those properties originally belong to the state and when the state takes over uh, those properties, there is really no need for compensation as provided for in this specific provision on health, safety, or security. Land ownership above and below it. It reads the owner of a parcel of land is the owner of its surface and of everything underneath it. And he can construct their own any works or make any plantations and excavations which he may deem proper without detriment to servitudes and subject to special laws and ordinances. He cannot complain of the reasonable requirements of aerial navigation. You know, when I was a, a, a student of uh, business administration and we had commercial law and we bump into this, uh, my, my, uh, my very naughty mind uh, and imagination did uh, toss the question to the law professor. I remember this was uh, the date Attorney Romeo uh, Pineda, a, a class valedictorian in his law class at the Lyceum of the Philippines, one of the best professors that are bad in law. And so when he was explaining this, he said, anything uh, on top of the land or on, on top of this land, yes, is property uh, is, is uh, property of the owner. And you can extend up to the skies and therefore that, that vertical uh, projecting uh, line is part of his ownership. And when he now therefore also looks down, he would therefore be uh, also claiming possession and control over the property. And I stood up and said, sir, when technology comes into the picture and I'm standing here, for example, in Sampaloc, Manila, and I happen to own this land and I'm able to make a laser beam to penetrate the piece of land that I have, it is possible because the globe is round that while I'm standing here, that particular laser beam will hit, you know, a piece of land here, which is probably Texas to Texas. Can I claim, therefore, that I also own that property because it is above and also below? 
And he had a very naughty smile because if you really become strict about it, you do. And you have now a conflict, you know. And my imagination was telling me perhaps the law to be reasonably applied would have a boundary. And that is essentially, you know, the the middle of that particular uh, earth, you know, would be your boundary. On the other hand, uh, going up, your boundary is, of course, uh, any space that uh, aerial navigation can use. In other words, it is still your property, but you have no right to question if there are airplanes and, of course, satellites that could use that. No? So if you want to make a projection, when you look at the moon, you start claiming also that your property right extends up to the portion that your land is hitting the moon. And perhaps one of these days, when you're old enough uh, as a justice and this case is brought before you, then you use your own imagination to rationalize the decision that you will make. The very interesting concepts in law. Finally, our discussion on ownership talks about a very interesting topic on ownership of hidden treasure. The provision reads that hidden treasure belongs to the owner, we repeat, the owner of the land, building, or other property on which it is found. So, we need to, to rethink, you know, our, our fundamental layman's uh, understanding. Even today, uh, a person is walking down the street and he finds 500 peso on the pavement. He picks it up, you know, looks at on his right side and left side and nobody sees him, so he's, he pockets at 500. We know that that particular act is an illegal act because that particular bill, you know, if not returned to the person through the mechanism of surrendering it to uh, the proper authorities, theoretically the mayor of the city or town where he belong to, then the act of taking that particular 500 peso bill is an act of theft and punishable under the revised penal code. Now, if on the other hand, you were uh, in, in an open field, you know, cultivated open field, and while you were digging, you suddenly found a box full of uh, jewelry, uh, and, and so it must be worth, who knows, about 10 million pesos. Since you are the founder, it will get into your imagination that that particular uh, treasure, hidden treasure at that, that you found uh, buried in the land that you were a able to excavate belongs to you. The law says that that hidden treasure does not belong to you. It belongs to the owner of the land owner of the building, or owner of any other property on which it is found. Of course, interesting, what if you found that in the open sea? And so that is now public domain. And so the treasure belongs to this state. Continuing, when the discovery is made on the property of another or of the state or of any of its subdivisions and by chance, one half thereof shall be allowed to the finder. Oh, this is now the allocation. So he discovered it in the property of another. And conceptually, it belongs to the owner of to, to the land building or other property owner. But the entitlement you deserve is one half of the hidden treasure oh, that you will get. This is not yours, it is from the owner that you now secure the permission to get one half of it. The same is if it was found in a property of public domain. If the finder is a trespasser, he shall not be entitled to any share of the treasure. And so it is possible uh, that you went in inside a ranch, you know, and uh, or an agriculturally uh, developed uh, land. But you have no reason to be there. You know, you had just happened to be an intruder then conceptually, you are not entitled to any share at all. So somebody is smart enough to say, why should I therefore report this? 
when I am not pala entitled to it. Might as well just take it away from me. Which conceptually is again theft. If the things found to be of interest to science or the arts, the state may acquire them at their just price, which shall be divided in conformity with the rule stated, meaning the owner of the property, 50%, and the finder who is not a trespasser is 50%. And so to close uh, this discussion on hidden treasure, treasure is any hidden or unknown deposit of money, jewelry, or other precious objects, the lawful ownership of which does not appear. And so if there is somebody who claims that he is the owner of that particular uh, treasure, then it is not uh, a finding that you can subject to this rule because it is no longer hidden treasure, but somewhere along the line, a treasure where you have an owner. And so this is our first round, ladies and gentlemen, on the discussion of property in the subject matter of the general concepts of property and ownership, a subject matter under civil law. We will, uh, we hope that you enjoy this first salvo. The concepts are not difficult, but it is important to know that they do exist in the civil code. And we will schedule uh, subsequent uh, uh, YouTube uploads uh, that would be follow that, that would follow this first episode on property, uh, general principles, and ownership. What is scheduled after this is the concept of accession. So, if there are fruits to the properties, how are the fruits handled? That will be the next subject matter of the discussion on property. I enjoy uh, actually reviewing these concepts again that I have not seen for quite a while. And it reminds me of the time when I was a law student and I had a very good professor who happens to be the author of the book on property. The book was so thick and I was so interested but my interest started uh, getting to be a disappointment because after the first meeting, the professor decided not to appear anymore. And subsequent uh, meetings, and that was about, I think, three hours, we never saw that supposedly outstanding professor. And... Uh, we waited up to the final exam, and on the final exam, his driver came, carrying, you know, some of these uh, examinations. And I was really so scared for my life, because uh, this is the first time that I have not seen a professor for the whole semester on a subject that is very interesting. And so, uh, when I saw the examination sheet, even if that is not allowed, at the last part of my examination booklet, I wrote a love letter. A short love letter saying, Dear Sir, may I ask you a personal favor of just checking my paper for the answers I gave. You know why I had to say, write that? I was so scared that he would probably just look at the sky and give everybody a tree. While three is a passing mark, I did not feel I deserve a three. Among ourselves, uh, assuming that not so many people will view this, every meeting for three hours, I will be sitting inside that classroom. Initially, uh, two or three meetings, there were still classmates of mine. But after a while, when they got used to the professor being absent, and they heard it from previous semesters that that is the methodology of that professor to teach that is to be absent forever. I decided to sit right there in the middle of that uh, empty room. I would read my assignment, you know, my books. I had a budget for completing my codal provision and the commentaries and allocated the whole semester, not only studying uh, on my own, 
<coughs> but also sitting right there in our classroom imagining that the professor was there and he was lecturing on what I am reading about. That is how I studied the subject matter of property and that is why this subject matter is very sentimental to me. And so it came to pass that uh, my classmates must be uh, laughing at my craziness. But I have budgeted my time to, uh, to study property uh, for that semester uh, every, every week, three hours. And so I see no reason why I should go home or I should just be bumming around. I, I spent my whole semester sitting there imagining the presence of a lecturing professor. And that is the reason why I ask him, just correct my paper because I did attend your class and I tried to, to learn your lesson in property in your absence. Well, I, I noticed my grade was different from my other classmates. He must have read my commentary and probably went in through my uh, answers and hopefully my answers were acceptable. Later on, uh, after that semester, I had the chance to cross enroll here at the University of Manila on a subject matter that was part of the old curriculum and was never offered anymore. This is uh, Roman law. But uh, the good professor that was handling it uh, later on to become Dean Michael Moralde was so efficient. He finished Roman law, I think, in two to three meetings. Totally. And so we had enough time, and that was a summer session, to consider other subject matter. He said, are there any subject matter you want us to discuss uh, for the remainder of our summer? And uh, there, were, uh, there were some suggestions on the family code. I was happy to learn the family code. And I, I did suggest property. And he did cover property. And so for the second round, I started learning property this time in the presence of Dean Moralde. And so now I'm passing on those uh, very lonely uh, uh, study time that I spent inside that classroom pretending that the professor was there. I forgive that professor. At least up to now, I still remember the lessons I learned from his book and the textbook. Anyway, maraming salamat. Pinagtsagaan niyo itong lecture na ito. Meron mga susunod pa. And this is an overdue lecture already. I'll see you again uh, in the next uh, uh, uploads and I hope you enjoy watching this. Maraming pong salamat for all of your patience, for all of your patronage, and for all of your support. Huwag nyo lang pong kakalimutan dito po sa baba. Meron nakalagay na subscribe. Pakipindot lang po kasi maray, malayo po po sa ating target. Wala pa tayong 300 dun sa 1,000 cut off ng YouTube. And I love you all. I'm always very happy to bring these things for you. Maraming maraming salamat.